Hi, my name is Sarah, and I live in Central California. Hi, my name is Matthew Ferguson from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, Nora. This is Gabrielle from Atlanta. Hi, my name is Minahil. I'm 17 years old from Pakistan. Hi, Nora. This is Mark in Seattle, Washington. Hey, so this message comes from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I live in Washington State. Hi, Nora. My name is Gabby. I live in Philadelphia. Hi, Nora. This is Courtney from Los Angeles, California. I actually used to live in Louisville, Kentucky, and I found this really surprising. I was not at all aware of human trafficking while I lived there. I know as a medical assistant myself, on more than one occasion, I was the one that saw the signs before my physician even had a chance to go into the room. That was only because I, myself, am a survivor and knew the signs very well, and I was able to point them out to my physician. I have paid for sexual services. You know, I still have very mixed feelings about it. I don't think it's a thing I'll do again, but I can't say for sure. We like to see things as black and white, and that's all. We like right and we like wrong. But what we always choose to ignore is there's million shades of gray in between. I think back to when my abusive boyfriend, who I thought loved me, introduced me to this older white dude, and he told me that he has a lot of money. And I was just so naive to the concept that he wanted me to get that money from him. Welcome to the final episode of this season of Sold in America. I'm Noor Tagori, and before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much for listening. More than 10,000 of you have reached out through our texting number. So many of you have sent over your stories from all over the world, and it has been such an honor to listen to them. Thank you for your courage and It has not only made me feel like I'm less alone in this journey of covering this and in my own experiences, but I've realized that globally we are a community who has been involved in this, who has had some type of relation to these stories, and that there's something that we can all do about it. And this is what this episode really is about. It's about answering all of your questions, sharing your stories, your voices, your thoughts. We want to end on a note of hope and reminding you all that there is something we can all do to make this better. One thing I've heard from you all every single day since this podcast has started is what can I do? What can I do to be a part of this? What can I do to make this better? And that is the conversation we're going to have today. We have two guests with us today. Both were in our show, so you will probably recognize their voices. The first guest is Kate Diadamo. Hello, Kate. Hi. Kate is a sex workers' rights advocate, and we also have Laura Lamoon. Hi, Laura. Hello. Laura is a sex worker and sex trafficking survivor. So we want to jump into some of the listener questions. The first one comes from Jillian Nikash in Bellingham, Washington. When I think about sex work, one thing I wonder is what our prostitution laws would look like if we could tease out the element of sexual morality. Now, I'm a big fan of sexual morality, but not the sexual morality of 1900 or 1940 or whenever these laws were written. I mean, we generally no longer believe that a woman having sex outside marriage is particularly immoral. What would our laws around sex work look like if we could wipe out all the existing laws and all our preconceptions about what those laws should look like and start with a clean slate. This is a rule that's in conflict with the rule of body sovereignty, and I can't justify yielding on body sovereignty on this. I don't think the criminalization of sex work makes sense in 2018. That is a really interesting question, and I think that's a question that applies to a lot of different things, not just sex work. But I want to ask both you, Kate and Laura, what do you think, what if we changed our laws based on the current sexual morality and not the old sexual morality? 
I mean, me personally, as both a sex worker and trafficking survivor, I see, especially with the anti-trafficking movement, like, I don't see society as having gotten, quote unquote, looser in terms of sexual morality. I see, especially under the current administration, like, sexual morality is very much rooted in, you know, antiquated laws and ways of thinking, you know, when these laws were formed and stuff. What about you, Kate? Yeah, I agree that I think it, I think it's a great place to start the conversation, but I think it is much deeper and much broader. And I also agree that I don't think we've moved as a society as far along as we think we have in a lot of ways around sexual morality. And so I wouldn't want today's uh, social mores to define those laws either. And I think the relationship between criminalization and legislating morality really does need to be questioned as well. I think the other piece of this is that, you know, the caller was right that this is about bodily autonomy and uh, sovereignty and that, you know, we don't criminalize sex outside marriage. The the thing that makes sex work criminal is the exchange of money. And so I think discussing about how these laws really function to criminalize the way that a lot of people are surviving is a really important part of this conversation. And a lot of the laws have just as much to do with the fact that you're talking about people who are very much marginalized from other forms of income and marginalized from other places that are not receptive to, you know, the flexible schedule that you need if you're a single mom, a place where you can't work if you're actively transitioning. And so people are forced out of those situations and have to participate in a lot of different economies in order to make ends meet. And that's what's really criminalized in in a lot of these spaces is that what is illegal is not necessarily just the sex. What's illegal is people who are relying on economies to survive. And the criminalization of poverty, the criminalization of informal economies are about that, are about forcing people to fit themselves into these institutions and these systems, which are not receptive to a lot of different folks in marginalized communities. And so I think if we're going to talk about, you know, the reason why these laws exist, yes, sexual mores are a piece of it, um, but so much of it, and if you look at the origin of these laws, are about really restricting the ways that, you know, independent women were making their income at that time and wanting to restrict that and wanting to restrict the power that uh, people with independent access to capital were gaining in different areas. One thing a lot of listeners have been asking is why we talk about sex work in a documentary that's supposed to be or started out as something around trafficking. And for me personally, this all started as a journey investigating trafficking in the United States. And quickly in our reporting, I realized, okay, the only way we're going to be able to properly cover this is if we actually talk about the entire sex trade and harm that's being done in the sex trade. and. The reason this documentary started out in one place and then ended up covering the entire spectrum was because we realized the laws surrounding sex work actually affect everybody who is engaging in the sex trade. And so I want to pose the question to you, Kate and Laura, why is it so important to talk about consensual sex work when we are talking about sex trafficking laws? You know, I think there's a couple of different reasons why these issues should be talked about together and also to recognize the relationship they have together. And I think the easiest way to do that is to talk about, you know, if you're looking at exploitation in agriculture and if you're looking at specifically trafficking in agriculture, you can't not talk about the industry. And sex work is really the only area where people think these are two completely bifurcated elements as opposed to, you know, in every single industry – because of capitalism, there's going to be different levels of exploitation. That gets higher when people are more marginalized, when people are criminalized, when you don't have basic labor rights, when you are isolated for a variety of different reasons. And those contribute to sometimes ending up in a trafficking situation. And that's understood in every other industry. But in terms of trafficking into the sex trade, that's really not the way that it gets represented. And I think a lot of people say, you know, I, I came in just looking at trafficking and now I'm seeing an entire industry where, again, that's not true for any other industry. And if you work with people who are trading sex, you know, trafficking – in all of the years that I've ever been organizing folks that are trading sex, trafficking has never been the single most pressing problem, the thing that people want to talk about. People want to talk about housing. People want to talk 
about criminalization and about their interactions with uh, systems. People want to talk about a lot of different forms of instability and exploitation and vulnerability that they're facing. And trafficking is very rarely on like the top 10 list of concerns and worries. And that's not how it's represented publicly. And so I think this is a really common thing to where, you know, trafficking is this very media-friendly story. But when you look at the breadth of what's going on, I mean, how many times do you hear about trafficking and you're not hearing about, like, basic labor violations in strip clubs, which are rampant? How many times are you not necessarily hearing about the fact that when you see a client and they rob you, there's really not a lot of outlets? And those are important forms of exploitation, and they're much more common forms of exploitation. And so, you know, looking at uh, the issue itself, understanding where trafficking fits within sex work is really important. Okay, this question comes from Amy. Hello, I'm Amy, and I have a question for you. Don't you think that prostitution is creating criminals in the belief that clients can do anything if they have enough money? Thank you very much. I think there's a maybe a whole lot of assumptions in that In my experience, the general public who's never done sex work um, has sort of an idea of, well, especially in anti-trafficking circles, has ideas of um, the quote-unquote buyers or the clients as these, like, big ogres, these horrible people who, you know, are just hell-bent on abusing and, and treating sex workers like crap and And certainly we don't want to deny that there can be violence in sex work, just like there can be violence and exploitation in agricultural work or deep sea fishing or whatever. But that's sort of saying that, like, basically because there's the monetary transaction happening, that that kind of relieves the client of all responsibility. Yeah, I I think... I totally agree that I think there's a lot of assumptions built into that question. And so I think, you know, first and foremost, just unpacking it might be helpful. Uh, And, you know, we create criminals when we criminalize behavior. A crime is just an action that has been deemed by a legislature, which is not representative, when that action is deemed to have criminal penalties. So that's what it means to create a criminal. And so first and foremost, I think what we need to do is really divorce this idea that a crime is anything but that. And there are some crimes, you know, murder, it's criminalized. That's, I'm fine with that. And we also have to recognize the very broad net of what is criminalized in this country. And second, you know, what what it sounds like uh, we're talking about is really, you know, under capitalism that people accept money for labor. And that happens in a lot of different forms. And, you know, we can talk about consent, but I, I always think about um, something that this brilliant youth organizer, Mitchell Mora, once said, which is capitalism is not consensual. You know, poverty is not consensual. And so if the primary concern is that someone's going to come along and offer an exorbitant amount of money for someone who has an economic need to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do, the answer is to give that other person options. I care much more about a person who feels like they have to do something that they really, really don't want to do because they have to meet a need than I am about what criminal laws look like when you're talking about abstract sums of money. And so if what we're talking about is that, you know, capitalism complicates how we understand consent, I think that's absolutely true. I think we have to look at capitalism and the way that we're not serving people who have really clear basic resource needs. If you look at meat processing factories in Texas, you'll be horrified. And so let's definitely talk about how what we consent to is very much constrained often by uh, unmet need. But let's do it in a lot uh, broader swath than just talking about the sex industry, or else we're missing a lot of people who really need that attention and focus. This question comes from Sharon, who is a chemistry student at Indiana University. 
I kind of was very interested in the conversation, decriminalization of prostitution versus legalization of prostitution. And I, I just kind of wanted to hear more about that of, because it's something that, you know, you don't really think about it. It's like, oh yeah, there are, I mean, there's obviously multiple, multiple ways to go about this issue, but just in the sense of almost weighing the pros and cons of each, it's kind of hard to say which would be more beneficial Thank you, Sharon, for sending that question in. This is a topic that I personally came to the realization about throughout this journey. When I first started working on this, I actually didn't realize the difference between decrim and legalization and how starkly different they are, especially when it comes to the sex trade. So, Laura and Kate, if you want to speak to the pros and cons and the differences to just clarify that. Um, Well, I think most sex workers that I've talked to are more in favor of decriminalization just because of what the person who sent in the question said about government regulation. So if you look at legalization, like in Nevada, for example, so there's mandatory STD testing just for the sex workers, not for the clients, which, you know, there's been very little, well, there's been no conclusive studies that have indicated yet that sex workers, um, at least in the U.S., that sex workers are at an increased risk of HIV or have HIV at more prevalent rates than the general population. So it's very a stigmatized practice. And I think that with legalization, like in Nevada, for example, you have to hand over 50% of your earnings to the house. I feel like with decrim, you know, we can hang on to our money a lot more and also hang on to our autonomy. So we don't have anybody telling us like, oh, you're dirty and diseased, go get tested every two weeks or whatever. Yeah, just to to build on that, decriminalization is about pulling criminal penalties for the exchange of sex for resources off the books. Legalization is about building a structure under which that happens that is still government regulated. And so that's not to say that under decriminalization models, there can be no regulation whatsoever. So in the world, there's only a couple places where there is decriminalization, and one of them is New Zealand. And there's still, you know, some regulations on the books about what it means to participate in the sex industry, but there's not necessarily criminal penalties. So it's regulated just like every other industry, which not only normalizes the industry, but it also, they're low enough barriers because they were developed in partnership with people that trade sex, they're low enough barriers to not be preventing people from entering. And everyone who works outside of that is still going to be arrested. And Nevada is actually the highest arrest state per capita in the entire country for prostitution-related crimes. They arrest in certain counties 10 and sometimes 100 times more people per capita for prostitution than anywhere else in the nation. And so that's a really important thing to remember is that under legalization, people are generally still criminalized and still marginalized, and the folks that are facing the harshest forms of criminalization remain in that state. Another uh, issue is that people do have to give incredible amounts of documentation very often to whatever state board is looking at that. And a lot of times, those are still subject to the same disclosure laws as every other form of registration. And so, There was an issue in Washington state where people were following the registration. They were giving over all their identification and personal information about themselves. And there was someone using that to stalk dancers at their homes because they had to give their home address. Thank you. Thank you, Laura and Kate, for those answers. This next message comes from Gloria from Queens, New York. The thing that keeps coming up for me as I listen to each episode, but especially the episode that focused on the buyers, is just how prevalent white supremacy is in this conversation. The reason that some people can just write off these poor, black, brown, drug-addicted, trafficked women is because they don't see them as human. And the reason that they can uphold these white women who are able to get a permit, who are able to do it, quote, the right way, is because their humanity is acknowledged. And it's just... It's frustrating, it's hurtful, and it's just really driving home the need for folks to be able to recognize that black and brown and poor women are human and deserve to be valued. Thank you so much, Gloria, for sending in that message. This is a theme that we have seen time and time again in our reporting. 
I know, Laura, you mentioned this right off the bat. So if you want to, if you want to start with this one. Well, instantly, I really appreciate her, her question or her message, because I mean, if you go to an anti-trafficking conference, it's like, it's just unbelievable. It's primarily, it's a lot of white men and white women who are very wealthy and have a lot of money and have um, a lot, a lot of privilege. That's one of the reasons, like, it's so important for survivors to center themselves in this movement because they are essentially getting fame, getting uh, money, whatever, on our backs. And, of course, none of them care at all. They're very strategic about what they care about. They're very disingenuous in that way. And I think they use a lot of black and brown bodies as sort of jumping off points for them to feel like the great big white saviors. And I see that a lot here, too, in Seattle. Uh, We have a lot of massage parlors And a number of them are run by Korean folks and some others by Chinese folks. You know, the police recently did an arrest of one of these massage parlors. And it's just very, they're very self-congratulatory about it. Like, oh, here we rescue these poor, you know, subservient Asian women or whatnot. So I think the narrative of the white savior runs really deeply in the trafficking movement. And I think also in the sex workers' rights movement, like we can't forget to talk about that too. The people who have the most privilege are people who are white, people who are escorts making hundreds, even thousands of dollars an hour, who have their own website, who go on tour, all of this stuff. Like we're not hearing from street-based sex workers. We're not hearing from outdoor sex workers, survival sex workers. They're the ones who have such a limited voice in the sex workers' rights movement, and that is really messed up. Yeah, I second everything um, that Laura said, and I really deeply appreciate this conversation about the role that white supremacy plays in this, because the caller's absolutely right that— you know, white supremacy shows up in a lot of different ways in this conversation and a lot of different ways that never get articulated. And one of them is that so many of these systems are completely based on white supremacy. When we're talking about criminalization and who's policed, we're talking about black and brown communities. When we're talking about, you know, who is barred from accessing basic resources for a variety of different reasons. When we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, that's who's most impacted by this is it's it's people facing economic uh, injustice and economic and and housing instability. It is absolutely over-policed black and brown communities. And the solutions that are most relied upon to address this are based on systems that are ingrained with white supremacy and patriarchy and classism. Absolutely. And we've realized throughout our reporting in this, that a lot of the people who are engaging in survival sex or the people that I've met personally who were formerly exploited were women of color, and they felt unseen and they felt unheard. And a lot of them expressed that, like, as survivors, their unhappiness (laughs) towards these advocate groups and human rights groups that are ignoring their voices or aren't listening, um, especially when it came to passing FOSTA-SESTA and how a lot of people felt like the sex workers and people who were involved in the sex trade weren't talked to before this was passed or aren't included in the conversation. And I think that this goes back to something that we were speaking about earlier, but getting to what our average listener or person can do to alleviate harm and exploitation in these spaces, keeping this specifically in mind. I think working to end white supremacy is probably number one, for sure, of things that can be done and should work to be done. And it's not like it's something, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. You know, it's not something you can do in a day. But I think just working along those lines is an extremely important step in uh, alleviating trafficking. And to me, trafficking, at least I'll speak domestically in the United States, has a lot to do with 
systemic oppression has a lot to do with poverty, has a lot to do with class, has a lot to do with race, gender, things like this. And the fact that, you know, in a majorly, majorly capitalistic country that has all of these issues, not everybody is given the same chances or opportunities. And I think fundamentally, the systemic oppressions are a big part of the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking. So I don't have like a nice soundbite of an answer about how to help trafficking or how to alleviate it other than to work towards being an ally in various movements and just trying to end different systemic oppression. So whether that looks like going and volunteering at a youth shelter or doing whatever you can, or maybe it's like giving some money to a friend or something who's lost their job and is going through a hard time, whatever. I just feel like, I don't know, I can't think of any, like, the one single thing that you can do that's like the slam dunk to end or alleviate trafficking. It's all really difficult systemic stuff. And I know people are very dissatisfied to hear that. (laughs) That's actually, no, not at all. And Laura, I love that you said that because my personal answer to people who have been asking is very similar to what you just said, because I went into this covering trafficking and being passionate about learning about trafficking and and wanting to work with anti-trafficking organizations because that's what I thought was like the immediate solution. And throughout this journey, I realized, wow, like there's so many systems things that are going on that create this oppression and create this exploitation. And so towards the end of the journey, I realized that one thing that I personally could do was work on alleviating youth homelessness. There are aspects of this issue that you can get involved in, whether it's volunteering at a shelter, getting involved with addiction services, or just asking survivors that you come across or people who are involved in this what you can do to help them, I think that's a great place to start. I think I would want to throw in there uh, just to kind of add on that um, everything you guys are saying is right. You know, trafficking, I think, becomes easy for a lot of people to get involved in because it is the culmination of a lot of institutional problems that people just don't know what to do with. And so, and by the time you get to trafficking, you've turned these institutional harms into an interpersonal crime. You can blame someone and you can criminalize someone and you can put someone in jail and feel like we've done something. When realistically, you know, the place to start if we're going to address trafficking comes long before it turns into a trafficking situation. You know, look at the area of social justice that moves you. Look at the issue of s- systemic poverty, of marginalization that you are passionate about and and put your efforts there because the less we marginalize people and the more we address vulnerability, the less likely it'll ever turn into a trafficking situation. And so when we're talking about all of these different pieces of how to address trafficking, trafficking is just the culmination of when social systems have already been failing people for a very long time. Absolutely, Kate. And I think part of the reason that that is the case is because trafficking tends to be an issue where everyone can agree there should not be any exploitation of anyone. And everyone can agree that sexual exploitation, labor exploitation is bad. So it's easy to hear stories about this and then not be critical of the stories or not be critical about how it was handled or not be critical about the policies surrounding it. And that's why we're having this conversation today because it's important for us to, if we're going to say we care about this, to dig deeper, to ask those questions, to pull apart at these uncomfortable conversations and situations and laws that are being passed because we now have access to the people who are being directly affected by it. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you, Laura. It was so important for us to bring in people who have seen everything firsthand, who have had experiences in all of this, and it's just so great to have you on answering all of these questions, so we appreciate your time. And that was the last episode of this season of Sold in America. I can't thank you enough for your stories, for listening, for engaging 
for having conversations, for reaching out with every single question, concern, and story, for your bravery in sharing your experiences with me. It has been such an honor and a privilege to be a part of this journey and to spend all of this time working on a story that is so near and dear to my heart. Thank you for letting me be vulnerable in this journey and share in the most honest way the way that I've grown and the way that I've changed and learned. A lot of it is from you, the listeners, who have shared so much with me. This is an ongoing conversation and story, and I hope you choose to share this show with the people that you love and people who you think will benefit from it. I hope you are able to figure out a way to be of service to people who are at the margins of our communities and to keep this conversation going. I'm always here for you to chat with if you ever want to shoot me a message and stay tuned for what we have to come. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Noor, N-O-O-R, or shoot me a tweet at N-T-A-G-O-U-R-I, that's n Tagori. I'll talk to you all soon. Stitcher. Hello, I'm Josie Lung, a comedian and a writer and all of that stuff, and I'm a whole lot of fun. And I'm Johnny Donahoe. I'm also a comedian, also a writer and an actor, and, and I'm, I'm quite fun. You're loads of fun. Thanks, mate. You're tons of fun. <laughs> this is our podcast, and it's called Josie and Johnny Are Having a Baby. With you. And if you can't tell from the title, we are about to have a child. We really are. And we're clueless. We really are. <laughs> we have a whole host of questions that we're trying to ask, like... How are we going to pay for this thing? Is it a problem if you lose it? How are we going to work around this thing? We're asking lots of famous people who happen to already be parents to help us answer these questions and more. Josie and Johnny are having a baby with you is out now and you can hear it on Stitcher, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, your <laughs> only job in the beginning is to feed and change and hold, feed and change and hold. But you need to sleep as well. Johnny, that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> okay.